good morning, GP Test Green Dot 319. How are we all doing today? Now, today we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to talk about Jeep accessories, okay? Now, I'm going to show you one accessory today, which I'm going to go out on a limb here. I'm going to guarantee I don't think anyone would have ever seen this before on a Jeep. I don't think you would have ever seen what I'm going to show you as well. So I'm quite excited about this because I got hold of it and I put it on here. It's just a little detail, but it's something which is specific to my Jeep, which I think you guys might really appreciate. So we'll have a look at that in a second, but we're going to look at accessories today for Jeeps. Now, if you remember with my GPW, I didn't put anything on it, so I left it sort of factory, factory standard with the blue markings, none of the white markings or unit markings or anything like that. So that was a completely factory standard Jeep. But now we're doing this D-Day Jeep, we can start to put some of the sort of cool bits of bling on it that people who have Jeeps love to put on Jeeps, okay? Um, and I'm sort of being selective about it, and I want to show you some of those bits, and we can talk about them. We'll just talk about the specific bits to a D-Day Jeep or a, a European theatre Jeep, which it may have picked up as it went through the European theatre after D-Day. So let's have a look at some of those, and let's discuss some of the bits that we've got going on here. Okay, peeps, the first little bit of bling that we fitted to our Jeep is the hull compass. You sometimes see these in photos of uh, Jeeps on the European theatre. It's a little civilian compass, actually. I'm not entirely sure how they came to be fitted to Jeeps, whether it was just a GI brought them across or something like that. You see a couple of them. I don't think they were an issued item, but it's just a little compass that helps you point north, south, east, and west, of course. This one just has north, south, east, and west, but you do get ones which have, which would be more useful for a military sort of uh, setting, which say 10, 20, 30, 40 sort of thing. But this is a more basic one. It's just a little simple Bakelite compass. It comes with a little data sheet about setting it up. Obviously, the Jeep all being made of metal and this being a compass, magnetism is affected by metal. So when you put it on a Jeep, you need to compensate for the metal inside the Jeep. So you can set it all up, spend a lot of time driving around, compensating. So it's all included in here, all explains it. But of course, one of the things you can't sort of change is when the Jeep is running and when the Jeep is off, the magnetism is differently. So look, if you should be able to see there, if I just push the starter button, just watch inside it, you should see the uh, compass rows move, okay? So you see, the magnetism is different when the Jeep is on and off. So it's not entirely uh, an accurate thing. It's just sort of gives you a rough idea of which direction you're pointing in. So it would be useful if you're driving around and you just needed some orientation sort of thing. But that's a cool little bit of kit there. Putting it um, in the right position is, um, is interesting because there isn't a set position for these. Some people have them on the windshield. Some people have them down here, but down here it obviously gets in way of the e-brake. So I put mine here where you can see it quite easily and it's not in, uh, it's not possible that someone's just going to knock it off accidentally. The only thing about it is, is putting a little bit of bling on like this is that someone might nick it because it's quite, <laughs> it's in a really prominent place and it's quite small and quite easy to remove. So these are sort of things you've got to weigh up when you start putting uh, little bits of bling on your Jeep. But um, that's the whole compass there. So that's number one piece we put on. So I've been spending a lot of time on YouTube looking at high quality archive footage to see just what accessories they were putting on Jeeps. The answer to that is pretty much anything you can think of. A Jeep is a pack mule and they just loaded them up okay. But one of the uh, sites I've been looking at is HD Archive, okay, and I'll put a link in the description below. And that's got hundreds of hours of really high quality archive footage, completely, um, you know, unfiltered or unedited footage um, of the invasion of Europe. And it covers all sorts of stuff. And you often see Jeeps, you know, exactly how they were set up. So you can take a lot of information from that. One of the things I've noticed is a lot of them did have wire cutters on them, okay? Um, not on D-Day, of course, because they didn't know about the wires across the road. Um, it only came later that they start to put them on. And I'm not entirely sure whether I'm going to do one or not, but it would be very correct to have a wire cutter on the front of the Jeep. The other thing you often see as well is a lot of bustle racks as well. A lot of Jeeps had bustle racks, you know, they were really packing them full of stuff and they needed that extra space. So bustle racks were very, very common as well. Um, one of the most common things to see is the rope on the front, okay? And it's an easy thing to do. And you can see why you would have a rope on the front because you get stuck everywhere and you need pulling out. And if you don't have a rope, you know, you're up um, SH1T Creek. But if you want to put one of these on yourself, people do make them up already, but you don't really need to do that. All this is is three strand, one inch manila rope. You get a 25 foot long length and you put an eye splice in at either end, okay? And it's really not difficult to do at all, okay? Um, I'll put a link in the description below, which takes you to a really good video explaining how to do the eye splice, because if you just look at images, it can become a bit of a, a nightmare. And I did spend a lot of time <laughs> working out how to do this, but the YouTube video makes it very easy. So if you want to do it, have a look at that and get your uh, your tow rope fitted. Now, often people do the tow rope coiled all the way around it, but I think they quickly learn that having it coiled up like that, you can't use it quickly. You know, if you're stuck, you don't want to be 
unwinding the damn thing for hours or whatever. So you just have it easily, it just goes over the bumper and it's just wrapped around it very straightforward. So you can whip it off in three seconds if you need to, to get pulled out of somewhere rather than doing the finger trap, trying to get it off there. But yeah, one inch manila rope makes your tow rope. Cool little accessory there. Very, very common, you see loads of those. Have a look at the HD archive footage as well and have a look at some of that information. Before we move on to our next European theatre accessory for the Jeep, I just wanted to go back to the uh, late war Solex carburetors. Now, if you don't know about those, have a look at the video just above you up there. That explains these uh, rare little late war carburetors used on World War II Jeeps, not post-war, actually used on World War II Jeeps right at the end of the war, okay? And would you believe I've got hold of another one? So now I have four of them, kindly through another YouTuber who happened to have one in um, the UK this time, so they're all in Europe, these things. Um, we got hold of this nice example here, but the, one of the things on it was it had something I really wanted, which I didn't think I'd ever find. Originally, I used a reproduction draft tube, which connects the horn down to the carburetor. I found a, uh, one of the ones I had came with a reproduction one, some would have made up, but I didn't have the original one. Now, luckily, this carburetor here had the original tube fitted to it, and here it is. It even has the correct original band clamp. So finally, my um, original late war 32 AIC setup is complete, fitted to the Jeep with the original draft tube and the original clamp. So those of you who like your, your carburetor geekery, here it is. We finally completed it completely, and it looks exactly like the World War II photos of those uh, French carburetors fitted to original World War II Jeeps. So I'm really pleased with this really, really rare little thing here, even rarer than the carburetor, this nice little draft tube. So that's another great little thing to finish this off. Let's just go back a little bit. Let's just have a look at this engine block, which we were working on last time with a crack repair, okay? So you know, this is my test engine. This isn't to go on to a Jeep. This is to test things out and see what we can and can't do with it. And as you can see, it is all fixed now. So what I did in the end is I sent it off to the cast iron repairer and he sent it back to me and it, here it is all ready to go. <laughs> No, of course it's not like that, no. It is, uh, <laughs> we've gone down the JB Weld route, okay, of course, because we're just doing this as a test piece, okay. So we found that TIG welding old dirty cast iron blocks like these, which are completely contaminated, just doesn't work um, at home, you can't do it. I mean, you could use stick weld or something like that, but TIG just didn't like it whatsoever. So that didn't work. So it's mostly crack repaired using that, but then we just went with JB Weld over the top of it to dress it out and really seal it all in there, okay. There is a trick you can do with JB Weld, which I'm sure some of you are aware of then. If you heat up the thing you're working on, so if you get this warm before you put weld on it, if you've got to fill in a load of cracks or things like that, the JB Weld sort of melts um, as it goes on there and it flows really, really easily and really nicely. So if there's loads of little cracks and voids you want to get into, get the torch on it, heat it all up, not too hot, you know, just not so it's bubbling or anything like that, just warm enough so that when you touch it on there, the JB Weld melts like butter and it flows all the way into all the cracks and things like that. So this will be completely sealed up now. I've just dressed it out a little bit. I'll do some more tidying up work on it. But for what we're going to do with it, I think this is going to be a really good fix for it. And we can see if it does, you know, if it does work um, properly. And you know, I'm slightly concerned over time that, you know, the expansion and contraction of it may cause cracks in the world, but the, or the JB world, should I say there. But I think it'll be all right for what we're doing. So we did learn something with this um, crack repair that um, you can't really TIG weld it at home. There may be other ways of welding it, but TIG welding just didn't work. But at the end of the day, there's always JB Weld. Okay, Jeep aficionados, here it is, the last uh, accessory that I've got. And this is the thing I'm most excited about. I've been keeping it hidden away from you here because this thing really is very rare and I've never seen one of these anywhere. It's very specific to the carburetor which is fitted here to the late wall carburetor. If we go back to that last video, if you remember, there was a little bit in Army Motors which said, when you put the Solex carburetor on the French carburetor, you should mark the Jeep up so that you only um, so that anybody getting in one knows the difference between it, that it's not fitted with a WO, but it's fitted with a Solex. And if you try to treat it like a WO, you can't get the thing to start. OK, so here it is. You ready? It's probably the only Jeep I think fitted in the world with one of these. If I'm wrong, I'll be uh, surprised. And just before we go in there, I get told every single video here. I know this windshield catches upside down. It's OK. It's just there so I don't lose it. All right. Till I put the windshield on here. So you don't need to tell me. Here it is. The original placard, the original Solex placard, which tells you how to use the Solex carburetor. Incredible that um, I've got hold of one of these here. You can see I've pasted it on there using PVA glue. It's all hidden in there. And all it is, it's a very simple little thing. It just says caution, Solex carb. When pulling out, choke, keep the throttle closed. Because of the way that the starter works in the Solex carb, 
if you open the throttle like you might do with a, um, a WO to spray some fuel in there, it breaks the, um, the vacuum and around the throttle plate and the starter won't work. So should we just see if that's true or not? Should we push the throttle down and see if it will start or won't start? Okay, so here we go. Let's pull it out to its first position. There we go. Jeep hasn't started in a week or two. So um, anyway, so it shouldn't start then. If we push down the throttle, oh, hello, it shouldn't start. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that certainly does not seem to start. Right, let's uh, take our foot off the throttle. Let's try again. Ta-da! So, important little piece of paper there. Very, very rare, and I'm really pleased to have fitted it to the Jeep. Just going back over that picture we had of um, all those Jeeps parked up with the wire cutter and the bustle rack on there, I just looked above the throttle and choke cables, levers, and I could just see a little placard there, but sadly there's not enough information to zoom in on it. I was hoping it would be the Solex placard, but the timing and everything isn't right for it. I think it's just too early and it doesn't look quite the same either. So sadly, I don't think it's a Solex placard. It'll be another warning, uh, warning placard of some description they had on there for whatever reason, but oh well, you can but hope, but everybody, that is it for this week. I hope you enjoyed that. Like and subscribe. Join me on Patreon if you want to keep supporting uh, this sort of uh, crazy stuff. And we'll keep on going. But until next time, enjoy jeeping.